skeptics in the hovers. I see that I'm frozen. This is my old computer, I'm afraid. I have got a new one. It's coming either tomorrow or Friday, but I'm assuming that you can hear me. And I'm going to introduce my guest, who is Josh Davis. Josh, speak to us. <laughs> hi, hi. Yes, you definitely are a bit uh, frozen there, John, and uh, about five minutes behind me as, as we speak. So I'm Josh Davis. I'm a, a reader of applied psychology at the University of Greenwich. I'm going to go and talk to you a little bit about miscarriage of justice and how they might occur. Brilliant. You do a bit on criminology too, don't you? Oh, I do. I do indeed. Well, my, I, I mainly teach psychology, but um, I also teach some uh, criminologists and criminal psychologists. Yes, and I've um, arranged myself in my gallery out of you know respect for the august building that your university occupies. So, uh, before you start your presentation, I'd like to remind those of us who used to come to our pub meetings of the splendid presentation you did on super recognizers. Okay. Thank that's, you. That's, and that was an interesting subject, which if you're willing, we may get you back on Skeptics in the Hub to do on another occasion. Yeah, yeah, you know me, always happy to do that sort of thing. Great, you wanna get some books ready to sell, make a, bit of, make a few oh, bucks. Yeah. <laughs> are you going to try your presentation yes are we ready yep you can you can we can only try right let's have a go if my poor old computer gets red hot i'll spray water on it okay can you see my screen now not only can i see it but it's there look brilliant okay, okay. So i'm going to take myself down and I'm going to full screen your slides. And it's over right. to you to give us the voiceover. Okay. Okay. Lovely. Yes, thanks very much. Okay. Well, uh, so as you can see, my title is Miscarriages of Justice, a psychological perspective. Probably should have been a psychologist's perspective because there's so much content that I could have put in here. And in fact, I have a whole term of lectures on this, this topic. So what I've really done is taken a tiny snapshot of one or two things. But, but what I'm gonna do first is sort of introduce my history. Um, so I, I, my, my PhD was on the way that um, CCTV images are used of for identification purposes, mainly in court, but also outside court. Most of the research I did was conducted at the Science Museum, uh, and I did this at um, sort of Goldsmiths uh, University of London. Uh, I've done some various topics since, and as you'll see from the content of this presentation, uh, a lot of my work's been done on eyewitnesses, uh, and, and eyewitnesses sort of making wrongful uh, identifications, misidentifications, may be the most um, uh, main cause of miscarriages of justice uh, and wrongful convictions, as you'll see later. Um, also done some research looking at rape and domestic violence from a sort of an, another perspective. So with eyewitnesses, it's it, a, lot of, a lot of the research is about reducing um, wrongful convictions. With the rape and domestic violence research, it, it's, it's how can we help the police ensure that uh, there are more convictions of people who are genuine, genuinely guilty of crimes. Um, and, and John sort of mentioned super recognizers. So most of my research at the moment is on people with absolutely amazing memory for faces. And I've worked with a, a few police forces around the world identifying these people who uh, generally make lots of identifications from CCTV. You can see the link back to my PhD. And I'm also sort of doing collaborations with a number of researchers from different countries around the world. So but let's talk about miscarriages of justice then. First thing I'm gonna do is actually talk about, well, what is a miscarriages of justice? 
Uh, many people uh, immediately think of wrongful convictions when they think of a miscarriage of justice. And, and I would I would agree these are the perhaps the, the worst examples or some of the worst examples of when the criminal justice system can go wrong. As I said, uh, from my perspective, many of them are caused by eyewitness, honest eyewitness identification errors. But it's all a little bit about cognitive bias and how that might have an impact on police investigations and also on, on forensic science. And then it'll be up to you to ask some questions. So, so what is miscarriage of justice? Uh, you know, I focused on uh, wrongful convictions just then, but I'd argue that it's when anyone or even anything, a, a, an organization, which might be a victim, complainant, witness, suspect, defendant, prisoner, member of the public, police officer, sort of institutions, and I've even put animal there with, with a question mark, does not have access to justice, and somehow justice is unfair on those individuals. And in particular, when a criminal act is or is not assumed. Um, and as I said earlier, I think the worst perhaps might be, uh, and, and make some of the most worst headlines is when there's been a wrongful conviction of someone who is entirely innocent of a crime. And sometimes obviously people get off on technicalities following perhaps an appeal court case. But I'm going to show you some cases uh, or evidence of cases where there's absolutely no doubt that people went to prison for very long periods of time, crimes that they did not do. Um, and on the other side of it, it is, of course, the sort of guilty person's acquittal. Someone who actually did commit a crime, somehow perhaps they've, they're found not guilty by a court, perhaps they have um, the, 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 the Crown Prosecution Service decides not to actually prosecute and take them to court in the first place. Perhaps the, the police decide not to investigate that crime. Of course, that's a miscarriage of justice to a victim of those crimes. And, and I would argue to society in general as well. Um, the focus tends to be on the former. There's a very good likelihood that actually there are far more of the latter, that guilty people are far more likely to go free than um, innocent people are, li are likely to be convicted of crimes. So wrongful convictions. Um, we focus on the innocent defendant, but there are also lots of costs on families. If, let's say, for instance, a, a, a father is found guilty of uh, a crime and goes to prison for a very long time, obviously there are financial costs to the families. There's emotional support costs to the families. If that person is genuinely innocent, it's a waste of criminal justice resources to find them guilty, put them in prison for a very long time. Um, that's the worst issue to do with this, is that if, if a genuine crime has occurred, the real offender is, is out there and potentially is committing other crimes, as I will highlight in a few minutes. And that sort of under, undermines the whole legitimacy of the criminal justice system. And, um, you know, it's perhaps going to reduce public support and our witness, our willingness to assist as witnesses, jurors, or even report crime to the police. And in my my mind, I think, though, that the most serious miscarriage of justice is, is when the um, police, unfortunately, kill an innocent individual. Um, I think one of the, the, the good things about the British criminal justice system is that you can almost count on, on one hand where sort of cases such as John Charles de Menezes' case back in 2005 was shot by the police in Stockwell. Um, being mistaken for a, a terrorist. Um, and there are a series of cases, but if we sort of go over to America, that, that type of case uh, seems to be far more prevalent. And I, I, there was a, a, a case of a, a, a death I saw reported in the police, in the news today, uh, of somebody who was held down by the police and effectively seemed to lose uh, the ability to breathe while being held by, down in some sort of stranglehold by the police. And I would argue that those are the most serious cases, sort of less serious, but still 
a major problem to the legitimacy of the police is sort of wrongful police intrusions against the public. If they're specifically targeting individual races for a purpose, um, and you know, there's a large number of false positives, people who are entirely innocent, perhaps being arrested by the police, um, they do not lead to convictions. Um, and, and, and there might be the, some sort of argument that sometimes police might be rewarded even if arrests do not actually lead to a conviction. Um, there doesn't seem to be much career harm, perhaps, for failures to convict. And I, I'm guessing, to some extent, that's, that's a good thing, because, of course, sometimes the police will, for very, very good reasons, uh, believe somebody is, is guilty of a crime, which sometimes just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time, and they need to arrest that person to sort of gather further evidence uh, and quite often, of course, um, there is no conviction because uh, that person is innocent. Um, and then we can go to failures to bring the offender to justice. These can compromise public safety, quality of life, definitely are going to undermine the credibility of deterrence. We, if one person can get away with it, we can all get away with some offence. Um, uh, and I can perhaps bring mind somebody who seems to have done something in March that a lot of people might disagree with. Um, I don't really want to go down that route though. Um, and obviously widespread injustices to victims do reduce the public willingness to assist. If they make the media, it is a problem, it's a vicious cycle of lost legitimacy and it reduces public support in the police, in the justice system in general. I think you have to sort of have some sort of caveat though. Sometimes some individuals who, uh, for reasons of perhaps diminished mental capacity or can claim something like the insanity defense or maybe juveniles may not need to be um, uh, given the full weight of the law on them. And, and perhaps some, are, some might argue that sometimes people are evading justice because they're young. Others would have perhaps a, a more um, sort of tolerant attitude to juveniles. And really, I wanted to talk about these things because I think it's quite important how we define miscarriages of justice. But I think that the big thing to always consider, and I'm not quite sure how well uh, my slides show over the internet like this, but I use the scales of justice as a, as a watermark on all my slides. And I think it is a real balance. We have to weigh up the social costs of each type of miscarriage of justice. Because if we try to reduce wrongful convictions, it may be by doing that, it, it becomes harder and harder to actually find somebody who is genuinely guilty of a crime, guilty in court. Um, the protections on the defendant become too, too strong. Um, and of course, if we do it the other way, um, we may result in far more wrongful convictions of innocent people um, and also some inequalities of justice to certain members of society. Um, and I think one little message I want to say here is that failures to adequately fund the criminal justice system actually may result in both. And um, in, in my mind, austerity has reduced access to defendants to a, a fair trial in many cases. And it also has reduced access to victims in, in similar ways. If it's not fully costed, um, it, it is a problem to all of us. So I'm going to talk about wrongful convictions. And I do sort of apologies. I know some of my students may be watching this and they'll have therefore have seen some of these slides. And I'm sure many people who've um, who, who, who have knowledge of this area would do as well. But I, I always like to use the Innocence Project as a, as a good example of wrongful convictions where DNA evidence has been presented in appeal cases and effectively it is it has proved beyond any doubt whatsoever in the vast majority of these cases that the people who were convicted of the crimes definitely are innocent of those crimes. Um, obviously, there's all sorts of questions about whether they were guilty of other crimes, but I think I think in the sort of seriousness of these crimes, it, these, this message does need to be heard. 
Um, so there's, there's been well over now 360 cases since the Innocence Project was first set up in 1989, which is only a, a couple of years, two or three years before DNA testing became available in the first place. Uh, 20 of them were on were on death row. Um, on average, they spend 14 years in prison, the longest for 38 years. You know, he was released 2018. And if you say, take yourself back, if you were born that long ago, that is, to 1980, uh, it makes you sort of think about how long it might, what it must be like. How many things have you done in your life while that person was languishing in prison for a crime they didn't do? Um, many are members of minority groups, where by, by this I mean mainly black. Um, uh, some of them were under 18, quite a high proportion were under 21. And as you can see, the crimes that they were accused, wrongly accused of committing, are sexual assault, murder, sexual assault and murder. Um, and why is this? Well, because it's these type of crime where DNA is available. And in a way, although I think lucky is not quite the right word, but these guys were lucky, and they're nearly all men, they were lucky because DNA was retained after the, um, they, went, they went to prison. And it was that DNA, that small amount of evidence that eventually um, found them to be innocent of those particular crimes. Many crimes, there is no DNA. It's about five, perhaps 10% of crimes, DNA is available. So these are a snapshot of, of crimes. And as you can see, um, at least um, 150 violent crimes would have been prevented if the true perpetrator had actually been identified by DNA in the first place because the um, the actual perpetrator had, had gone on to commit a large number of crimes but after the innocent person was in prison. Um, I'm not going to talk about this. One of the other sort of interests that I, I, that, that I do give lectures on is on false confessions. A quarter of these people falsely confessed to the crimes. Uh, 40 of them actually pled guilty in court. And as you can see, many of those that falsely correct confessed were under the age of 17, um, had some sort of developmental disability or, or a mental illness. Um, many were denied parole because they actually refused to accept responsibility. They said, no, I'm innocent. I'm never going to say that I'm guilty. So that means that you can't leave prison early, even if uh, that, you know, that, that sort of parole board could actually speak to you. Also means that quite often they don't have any access to the sort of normal training courses that um, other people, prisoners would have who did accept responsibility for the crime. But I, what I really wanted to put across on today was that three quarters were convicted based at least in part on eyewitness misidentification, which is where I want to go to next. Half of them were cross-racial. Um, in some cases, multiple eyewitnesses identified the, the same innocent person. Uh, some of them, um, um, the, the, the witness made a facial composite. Uh, and about half were also based on improper or unvalidated forensic science. But I really want to go to the eyewitness misidentification um, now. Uh, just after this one last slide, sorry. Um, so the Innocence Project get about 3,000 letters per annum. Uh, quite a high percentage of cases are closed completely because um, any sort of evidence that might be able to um, uh, show that they're innocent, of course, um, is lost or missing. Some states do not keep evidence uh, once a um, somebody is convicted of a crime. Um, the Innocence Project reckon that more than 1% of all people in prison in America are innocent. Well, as there's over 2 million people in prison in America, that sort of suggests that over 20,000 people who are innocent are um, yeah, in, in prison as we speak. And just one little other statistic, the 2% you know, of people sentenced to death in 16 years, in, in, in 1973 to 89, were eventually exonerated and freed because um, they were 
guaranteed to be innocent. So I want to do a little experiment. I have no idea how it's, it's worked. In a way, this whole uh, session is a bit of an experiment for me, uh, trying to see if I can deliver a lecture online. We've been told at the university that we probably will be giving lectures online next term, whatever happens. So this is my practice run and you're my guinea pigs. Um, you're doing I use a... Hello. Get the thumbs up from me. <laughs> So you've got, you've got minute, please. Yeah. Can you go back a bit? I'm sorry, you, you went silent. Oh, did I? Yeah, I don't know why, but could you backtrack a couple of minutes? And Yeah, where do you want me to go? Any slide? We saw that slide. We heard oh, you. Tell so this, this one then? Yeah, that'll be good. Okay. So um, I'm going to try a little bit of an experiment. Uh, the university has told all us, us lecturers that we'll probably be doing some lectures online um, in, in the autumn uh, because of the lockdown, obviously. So I want to see whether this experiment works online as well as it does in a lecture theatre. So if you are listening, you might want to do, uh, click on www.menti.com and put this code in, 979854. And I'm going to show you a video. So this video is a suspect, because of course I'm talking about eyewitness identification. This guy is perhaps some sort of drug dealer about to do his drug because the CCTV cameras are uh, watching him. And if I play the video, hopefully you'll be able to see him okay. And not surprisingly, given this section's on eyewitness identification, you're going to be asked to try and identify him very soon. And as you can see, he nicely looks at the camera exactly how all criminals that you've ever seen on TV do, just to help the cops catch them. And there he is making his, his drug deal over the phone. And then, of course, he just walks out of sight underneath the camera. So I hope you all had a good look at that. Um, and I think pretty obviously, if you're a real eyewitness to, to a crime, you wouldn't expect there to be a crime coming up on camera in a couple of minutes. Most witnesses will be naive. So the way that they will think about what they see on, on, uh, in real life will be different to somebody who's warned, almost certainly. Uh, and of course, everybody then, looks at a lineup um, if they're going to do some sort of identification procedure. Yeah, well, I mean, you could imagine how fair that lineup is. It was the woman, no, the cat. Well, it could have been any of them. Um, yeah, I think I'd recognize that silly little hat anywhere. It's a really reliable witness. Um, if I could look, kick each one in the groin, I think I'd recognize his voice. I also do some research on voice recognition as well. Um, and here's a biased lineup. And of course, what do we mean by biased? Well, if you saw this lineup and you were the suspect in the case, you might not be very happy about it because for various obvious reasons. And if we had jump over to what we mean by uh, a different type of bias lineup, as you can see, well, the police could construct one made up of penguins. And what's a witness to do? It's useless, isn't it? It's impossible to try and I I identify someone like that. In fact, um, this is some research that um, I'm doing at the moment and intend to do over the next couple of years. Hopefully, if we get funded as well, to, to look some more at, at, at lineup and construction and what foils should you select. 
So really the reason that I did that little cartoon lineup uh, session was to put some delay into it. Because of course, if you're a real witness, you wouldn't do a lineup immediately. There would be some sort of delay. And in experiments even, it's very unlikely to be less than 15 minutes because I've only got 40 minutes in total. Obviously, I've had to condense this somewhat. Um, just think about how realistic though that was. How stressed were you? How upset were you? Um, if you'd been mugged perhaps by, you know, by a mugger, you'd be very stressed, you'd be very upset. And you know, for more serious crimes, it, it'd be very traumatic. Of course, watching from the safety of your sofa, it's probably not been a very stressful moment in your life. So we've got a lineup here. Now, here is a matrix. And so who is the person that you saw uh, a few minutes ago? Um, and just to make it easier, because some people say it's, it's better if you show one face at a time, I'm going to do this. So here we go. Num was it number A? Could it be number B? Could it be even number C? Well, how about number D? Number F? Oh, sorry, number E? God, and number F. Can't even read my own letters on a screen anymore. I think I need better glasses. Um, so here's the screen. What? I don't know if anyone's actually watching this live, but what we could do is just see whether Mentimeter works and put this up on the screen instead and see whether we get any answers in. The results are hidden. We've got two answers. Hmm. Oh, three. Well done. We've got three answers. I will show them in a minute. Four. Here we go. So we've I'll give one. it a... We've got one on the StreamYard comment bank too, which is a C. A C? Oh, okay. Well, we've got, we got some coming in from Mentimeter, so we've got a C. Um, so we've got five. Maybe if I go ten, nine. Now we have eight, a B four, F. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. One more B has come in. Uh huh. So here we go. Well, we've got a seven. I'm gonna I'm gonna show the results then, and and let's see what we got. Ah, so there we go. Uh, exactly what I was hoping for. I thought. Now, Hey, you can add mine. Oh, you think it was A? Excellent. Well, we're sort of leveling up. So I think you said C to uh, it a, bit, a little bit earlier, didn't you, as well? So we a C and we've had a B and a, or an F. Oh, and two Bs. So, brilliant. Well, well, exactly what has, has happened uh, as I was hoping for. As we can all see, none of you can make up your minds very easily, or at least if you have made up your mind, uh, there's a bit of a diversion of opinion, diverse of opinion uh, amongst you. And I just wanted you to think about what you've just done. You watched a video, hopefully it wasn't too pixelated or anything, only a few minutes ago. You were asked to do a lineup and you studied that person. And yet it's absolutely obvious that at least the vast majority of you must be wrong. It can only be one person in the lineup. Like, there definitely weren't doppelgangers or anything like that in there. It was a reasonably well constructed lineup. And 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 this sort of gives you an idea about oh, oh all of those miscarriages of justice, a lot of eyewitness identification errors, not perhaps that surprising if you guys can't do it with five minutes. And sometimes that sort of the normal time for a lineup is going to be about a week. Generally, at the earliest, sometimes they are quicker than that. But very, very often, they can be months or even years later. So um, I hope that sort of illustrates the problem with eyewitness memory. So if I go back to my slide, then I'm going to give you the answer. So the answer 
it's not actually in the lineup at all. So I sort of cheated then. And, and, and anyone who knows anything about lineups and, and police procedures will know that they actually sort of give a little bit of a warning beforehand that the person you saw committing the crime may or may not be present in the lineup. And we know from psychological study, a little bit like this experiment, if I had given you that warning, far fewer of you would have identified any one of, of these people. Well, you would have identified an innocent suspect. Well, I think that's quite conclusive that none of you are very good witnesses. And I suspect very few of you are super recognizers as well. But certainly if you made an identification. And, and this is the other thing about how we run experiments in psychology. We would have target present lineups. Sometimes I'll do an experiment where you do put the suspect, oh, sorry, the culprit into the lineup and you then get a sort of statistical uh, likelihood of that person being identified. And like the lineup you just saw, we would construct a target absent lineup for the case when an innocent suspect has been identified, the police has perhaps, you know, just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time, met the description that was provided by the witness, uh, you know, soon after the crime, all these sort of things means that there, there are occasions when innocent suspects will be inadvertently arrested. But I think the big story from this is you are not, you're not unique in any way whatsoever. Um, we know from a lot of research on real police lineups. So these are these are the ones run by the police, but about a quarter of all witnesses mistakenly identify somebody who is an innocent foil, who the police know is definitely not guilty. Uh, it's not like, you know, you may have seen it on a films where the police put a foil in and they turn out to actually be the criminal. There's no you know that that the, the probability of that happening is, is is virtually none. I'm not saying it would never happen. And of course, the police do warn the um, the witness that the culprit may not be present, exactly like I didn't do with you guys. And that tells us, therefore, that there must be a statistical risk of an innocent suspect identification if the police include yeah you know, the usual suspects in a lineup and they have very little evidence. Uh, in which, to, or reason to put that person in the lineup. Sometimes you hear about sort of fishing expeditions where, oh, we've just caught a, a, a robber for um, committing a crime here. Why don't we get all the witnesses who, um, you know, witnessed a, a crime by a robber in the last six months to come along, see if they can identify the same person in a lineup. I mean, that's a risky policy. I mean, I hope police forces don't really do that. Um, hopefully. Uh, they, they've learned by their mistakes and the mistakes lead to these miscarriages of justice potentially um, that have been identified in the Innocence Project. Um, so what I'm going to do now um, is just talk one more. I did say I'd talk about um, cognitive biases and in fact I think for me cognitive bias is 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 the main thing that perhaps causes the police to make mistakes to uh, lead to potential wrongful um, arrests, <coughs> wrongful convictions. So, what is a cognitive bias? Well, well, I'll just well, I'll just talk about forensic science first. So, decisions in forensic science, or even in in any science, should always be valid, reliable. And what you'd expect is, let's say, a fingerprint expert should reach the same conclusion if the same method is repeated with the same evidence. Different experts should reach the same conclusion if they're using the same techniques, and those techniques are reliable, of course. And then decisions should not be affected by cognitive biases. So, so what's a cognitive bias? Well, it's it's a Cognitive bias is to sort of search for, interpret, or remember information in a way that confer confirms your preconceptions, expectations, or hypotheses, and sometimes referred to as contextual bias. So the fact your mind is capable of taking a circle, two dots, and a line, turning them into a face, is nothing short of incredible. Still more incredible is the fact that you cannot avoid seeing a face 
when your mind won't let you. Uh, and I think from a sort of different perspective, I've heard the rhetoric from both sides. Time to do my research on the real truth. Click on Google. Literally, the first link that agrees with what you already believe, jackpot. There's a, a, a good uh, recent example of, of cognitive bias. So how can it direct police investigations then? Or, or, and and I, I, I would say there's a risk in any professional, any profession. But I'm going to talk about forensic science. And I'm going to talk about some research now that was done about 14 years ago on five fingered print experts. Uh, and it was done by this research was conducted by ITL Draw, who is at UCL in, in London. And, and these five fingerprint print experts with 85 years total experience between them um, had all agreed to um, be part of an experiment where they were told, well, over the course of the year, you're going to be given two sets of in, um, sets of fingerprints twice and you might be susceptible to cognitive biases and in a way these the, these experts said fingerprint experts are not susceptible to cognitive biases we will make we will provide reliable and valid evidence in every single case so um the for each expert a, a pair of real case fingerprints was selected for this study, which they had previously judged to be a match. Okay, so time one, match. In time two, they were sent the same set of fingerprints and asked to make a judgment. However, in time two, the information they were given was slightly different. The information they were given was that the fingerprints in time two were from were, called, were from the Mayfield print, which is quite a famous uh, fingerprint um, in, a, 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 in that in that world. And the Mayf Mayfield print was that um, at the Madrid train bombing in two thousand and four, um, a fingerprint on a plastic bag that contained the bomb uh, was erroneously identified by the FBI as being a guy called Brandon Mayfield, who was an attorney in Oregon. Um, and even his own expert appointed to his defense concluded that actually that was his fingerprint. So, of course, it didn't look very good for him. Later on, they found the true perpetrator and owner of the print uh, and Mayfield was released. So, of course, that generated some controversy in uh, fingerprint world. And so the five fingerprint experts, though, had actually never seen the Mayfield print. That was part of the inclusion criteria for the study. So just to go back again, in time one, they had uh, said these fingerprints are a match. In time two, they were sent the same fingerprints as time one, but told they were the Mayfield print. And just to give you an idea, I don't know how well, again, this, this screen is, but there's your crime scene fingerprint. And there's the innocent suspect's fingerprint. I have no idea uh, um, whether that looks like it might be the same if you're a fingerprint expert, but lots of them did at the time, even though it is not the same person's fingerprint. So in time one, as I said, all five of them said, well, that's a match. In time two, ignore all the contextual information and focus solely on the finger actual prints. Ah, these are the, from the Madrid bombing case. And as you can see, one only one of those five made a consistent decision in time one and time two. They said it's a match. Um, the One of them said, well, I can't actually decide in time two. But three of them, based on the information given to them, that it was the Madrid bombing case, the Mayfield print, changed their decision from... Uh, being a match to no match. That's quite concerning, as you can imagine, because you imagine that the police at the time, and they don't do it now, but at the time would sort of said, oh yeah, we know this guy's guilty. Here you go, here's the prints. Um, I'm sure you'll find they're a match. Oh, this guy's confessed. Here are the prints, what do you reckon? And of course, the, the sort of findings of this study really 
cause problems for the, the fingerprint world because they're basically being told, actually, you are susceptible to cognitive bias. And you've been doing this now since 1907, which I think was when the first um, fingerprint in depth was tested. Um, so, I mean, there are some criticisms here. It's a small sample. You wouldn't normally do, you know, a clinical trials of drugs with five people. You'd expect to use loads of experts. Also, there was some deception going on. So it was a little bit ethically dubious. You know, the, these people were told, this is the Madrid print. They were given wrong information. And that was their defense, if you like, that, that this is the problem with the study. You could argue, on the other hand, though, that even if 50 experts had been recruited and none of those other 45 had been vulnerable to that manipulation, you know, four out of 50 is still quite worrying when you've got 100,000 examinations per annum every year. So they re replicated this study. They got another bunch of fingerprint experts uh, to come along and say, yeah, we'll take part in this. This time it was slightly different. They didn't have something like the Mayfield print fingerprint whatsoever, but each was given four sets of fingerprints to match in two time periods over a period of year. And they, they had six fingerprint experts this time. And, and the expert was given this sort of information. You know, it could be he confessed to the crime. And then in time two, with the same fingerprints, someone else confessed to it. Or an eyewitness identified him, someone else was identified. Basically what I was talking about early, earlier, how the police might sort of give information to um, fingerprint experts um, about, you know, the crime and, and their belief in the guilt of the, the suspect in the case. Um, and what they found this time was, yeah, slightly fewer errors. And in, in fact, in the vast majority of cases, when in time one they said it was a match, 19 of those cases in time two in retest, they also said it a match. And in, in, you know, over 20 cases when it was no match, and again in time two, they, the fingerprint experts were consistent with their first decision. But as you can see, there are a few errors there where they have actually changed their minds. And these people were primed by the first experiment and obviously were even more determined not to make this type of mistake. And of course, the fingerprints came in their normal evidence bags. So they had no idea that these fingerprints were part of the study. Um, so I think this demonstrates that experts are susceptible to bias. And as I said earlier, all experts can be susceptible to bias. I've just highlighted fingerprint experts. ITL Draw has actually done this type of research in lots of other areas. So vulnerable to irrelevant, misleading contextual influences. It's part of being human, I'd argue, by the way. Um, extraneous contacts can influence decision making, cognitive flaws in limitations. Uh, in conducting objective independent processing and information evaluation. And uh, in that first experiment, only one of the experts demonstrated objectivity in decision making by giving the same decision at time one and time two, even though he was told actually that these were the Madrid, the famous Madrid prints. Uh, I should just say though, this is not the result of practitioner incompetency. It's not the result of flaws in fingerprint techniques. Fingerprint techniques are sound. It is the information that you give to the person making those decisions that can bias their decision making. So what happens today? Well, the good thing is, of course, that, uh, that if you're a fingerprint expert, you wouldn't be given any of this biasing information. Forensic experts are kept separate from the sort of evidence gathering aspect of, of, of policing. So they shouldn't know um, anything to do with whether the police officer thinks somebody is guilty or not. So that's great. But I just want to sort of turn it back to policing. But of course, police do talk to them, each other, and they do build up cases of evidence. And if fingerprint experts who are trying to use objective techniques, and there's no doubt in my mind they are objective techniques. It's just that if you're given information that you shouldn't be given, it makes your decision making subjective. And you could imagine, therefore, that where do these errors 
come from? Where do these miscarriages of justice come from? Well, perhaps, you know, for very good reasons that the police, somebody's at the scene of the crime, they say, well, let's put this guy on um, an eyewitness, you know, into a lineup with some foils properly selected. A witness statistically comes along and identifies that person from the lineup. And as you can imagine, this sort of can lead to a chain of cognitive biases where the police think, well, this person was at the wrong place at the wrong time. Now we've got a witness who identified them. And perhaps they found some other very, very circumstantial evidence that links that person to the crime. And I, and I said I wouldn't go into um, sort of confessions and, and, and interview techniques or anything like that. But perhaps when the police then put that witness into an interview, sorry, put the suspect in, into an interview room, and that suspect's vulnerable in some way. Perhaps they've got some sort of mental health problem. Perhaps the police might be a little bit heavy in their um, interviewing style, and that, that vulnerable person gives a confession. That is the sort of thing that might happen to lead to a miscarriage of justice. And I think that's the end of my talk. Thank you all for listening. And I'd be very keen to take some questions. Thank you, Josh. It's alarming, isn't it, about the unreliability of our justice system? Um, <laughs> I guess so, yes. I mean, I, I would like to hope that in the vast majority of cases, the correct perpetrate or the perpetrator of a crime is found guilty of that crime um i and i realize that we hear in the media about the th cases that go wrong uh, and these are very unfortunate but but actually it's the ones that just go there the routine cases where somebody is genuinely guilty um i i think that we have to say that on the whole the police do an exemplary job in quite difficult circumstances and, and, I, and also the court does as well you know the barristers and, and, and judges and magistrates but cases do go wrong and i come back to my start about what is a miscarriage of justice and how can we improve the system we go one way to become perhaps uh, to reduce the risk of wrongful convictions or wrongful arrests even, guilty people will go free. We go too far the other way, innocent people will go to prison. It's down to us. We vote for politicians who create the criminal justice system to make sure that they do a good job. Mm. Yeah. We're lucky. It, this is a democracy. It can campaign for improvements to our justice system but i got some I, quick I, you were going to say I agree. Mm, yeah good. sorry you went your, your your question went a bit delayed then sorry ah yes my poor old computer it's steam driven here Ooh. you are will has put up a question for us will is in the same sort of business as you He's a, a, a legal lecturer. Uh, but yeah, well, are we going to include the construction of false fake evidence, either by the plaintiff or the CPS that leads to a wrongful conviction? If you're, well, yes, definitely that would be in my definition of a miscarriage of justice. Uh, but I come back to why do they do that? And I, I, I would actually argue that it, it is a, a susceptible susceptibility to cognitive bias, actually. Um, and sometimes I think people who are genuinely trying to do the right thing, police, Brown Prosecution Service, uh, may think, oh, well, we haven't really got a really good case here, but I'm so certain, absolutely certain that this is the guilty person. Well, why don't we do whatever? nefarious activities that you sort of alluded to to try to ensure that person becomes guilty i mean i again we vote for the politicians the politicians pay the people working within the criminal justice system actually it comes back to our fault but i do say it's probably cognitive bias to some extent where yeah. people 
make a mistake. And of course, once they've made a mistake, they have to cover up that mistake. And, and that's the problem. Worse, worse than that, there's the people who try and play the system. We heard today about this uh, white woman who was exercising her dog in New York, and uh, it wasn't on a lead. And uh, she was told off by a black man for not having a dog on a lead, as she should have had. And she phoned the police and uh, accused him of molesting her or attacking her, being aggressive. He was videoing it. And <laughs> what a record of what really went on. And uh, she uh, has been uh, severely scolded on um, social media, I think. Well, yeah, I, I, I bet. I mean, I, I mean, one of the personal interests that I have for future research is in the use of body worn cameras, actually, and the sort of evidence gathering process of that. Is it a good thing if mm. all police are required to have these cameras? So the, in, in many ways, the police like them because it means there's fewer accusations of them acting improperly. And of course, unfortunately, unfortunately though, when it does go wrong, uh, they also can show evidence of yes. bad practice, yes. as we've all seen. Uh, as yeah. I mentioned, that that case I watched a video of only this morning of the black man who was who was strangle held and died in America. Yes. yes. Um, so, yeah. Is, is it, so yes, Will, your your definition is a miscarriage of justice, and it's probably the worst type of miscarriage of justice in the world apart from somebody being shot or whatever, um, as I mentioned earlier, but where someone deliberately um, causes a problem. Will's got another one for you. Um, the CPS operates a policy of not using Bayes' theorem to evaluate forensic evidence because it believes that on the whole, juries are incapable of understanding and correctly applying it. Do you agree with the stance? And if not, why not? I mean, for me, um, if I would cut I, I, a good example of a sort of Bayesian statistics uh, could be applied to eyewitness identification. And it's the prior probability that the person that you put in a lineup is is, is guilty or not. If, if you remember, I sort of said, well, if the police are doing too many fishing exhibitions are just shoving the same usual suspects in a lineup. That is a low probability of that person being guilty. In a way, that sort of exemplifies, I think, in a simple manner, what Bayesian theory means. Um, so to some extent, I agree. Um, I, I don't know about whether using though, that method with a, with a jury would confound them or not. Um, I have done some studies looking at instructions that you can give to juries in different types of cases, not statistical evidence as well. And you do find that even very slight changes to the words, so when I say juries, mock juries, a bit like you were mocking, mock witnesses a bit earlier, but very, very, very slight changes in words can actually change verdicts by these mock witnesses. So I do see why uh, there would be a worry about um, providing two complex explanations, statistics and things like that, to a jury. However, in the interests of justice, sometimes I'd argue it's absolutely necessary. Um, but you've also then got to have some sort of expert witness come in and explain these things, because it's unlikely that um, a barrister or a judge is going to be au fait with, with Bayesian statistics or anything else like that. I hope that answers the question. Do you know that... <laughs> Or the UK, the UK but, uh, do you happen to know the UK figures for wrongful? Um, it's almost impossible to know. Well, in fact, it, it is. It's in. It's impossible to know. Um, it's, it's, I think where we get our sort of rough statistics from uh, when you're trying to answer that question: how many people are wrongly convicted in the UK? As you can imagine, there are a large number of guilty criminals who are going, it wasn't me, Gov, you've got the wrong guy. Um, there's a bit of an incentive if you're, if you're in prison to claim that. Um, on the other hand, there aren't that many people going, actually, it was me, 
you, you're a convicted and innocent person. There's somewhere between the two. The sort of statistics I, I like are where researchers have asked judges and they sort of ask questions about, well, how many of the cases that you have heard as a judge did you disagree with the jury? So sometimes you would have found the defendant guilty and the jury found them not guilty and vice versa. And, and, and I don't know who did the research, but some statistics from America suggest that judges disagree about 10% of the time. Oh. So, but that doesn't still make them wrong. I mean, maybe the judges may be wrong, but of course judges hear a lot more cases. Uh, whereas a jury, I, I must admit, I'm quite unique. I've now been on jury service four times. And I do research in this. So I think the random selection from the electoral roll is picking on me in some way. Um, and I, I, I've done all types, um, guilty, not guilty. Um, uh, we've been, um, what do they call it, the judges uh, told us to, all to go home. I can't, there's a technical term of it. And also um, ruling guilty but mentally incapacitated. So, um, yeah, so I've had some interesting cases to be on a jury. But a judge, of course, hears cases all the time. A jury, generally in this country, may only do two weeks of jury service yes. and make decisions yes. once or twice. Yes. And therefore, it's really quite, uh, it's the legal arguments from both sides, obviously, can be quite complex, you know. Um, and then, then somebody throws some Bayesian statistics on top, which I must admit, I'm certainly not an expert in. <laughs> and I was sort of worried, well, gosh, now where is Bayesian theory when that question came up? <laughs> well, the judges have the experience, but I think you've had my share of jury duty. I've never been. <laughs> ah. So Max is asking, whether 1% false conviction is actually good. Um, so that was the Innocence Project's minimum. Oh. They presumed it was more than 1%. Uh, and they were also, so the other one is about police officers. I, yeah, so I talked about judges' estimation, estimates, uh, but police officers, people who have interviewed them as well in research, and they suggest about 1% to 3% of suspects that have been found guilty in court, whose cases they dealt with, were factually innocent of those crimes. Obviously, I suspect they interviewed those police officers, sorry, the, the questionnaires the police officers filled, filled out were completely confidential and anonymous. Um, but so that 1% value is low, okay? That's probably the lowest, and I suspect it's considerably yeah. higher. So if we apply this, I think in many ways the British justice system is a lot fairer than the American. I'm not saying the British justice system is perfect in any way whatsoever, but at least police are bound by the Police and Criminal Evidence Act and some other laws about how they should gather evidence. And yes, sometimes they don't necessarily stick to those rules to the letter. However, judges can throw out evidence if they want to, if they feel that the police have gathered it improperly. Uh -huh. In America, uh -huh. there is no such law, and every state has its own law about evidence gathering, what can be used in court. And effectively, judges get elected, um, attorneys get elected, prosecution attorneys in, in small towns and states. And there's an incentive to be tough on crime. You want to be elected as a prosecuting attorney in the United States. You want to be seen as tough. And at least here, barristers sort of will probably equally represent, you know, and their clients in a reasonably equal number of defense and prosecution cases. Whereas in America, the prosecution uh, lawyers are paid a heck of a lot more than the defence. Uh, so if you come out of Harvard and you want to work in criminal law, you're going to want to work for the prosecution if you want to earn a bit of cash. Um, so. Well, just silly, I'm criticising the justice system. Being elected on a party ticket to be a judge, not good. Yeah, I know. I agree. I agree completely with that. I, I don't quite understand it, but obviously... It, 
it's in their constitution or something and um yeah you know what we all know what they think about their constitution and uh i can't see that ever changing i mean i was slightly worried about the election of uh police and crime commissioners uh to, you know across this country as well and whether that would politicize policing um it certainly has uh you know there, there are arguments again i go back to um the, the case that's in all the news at the moment and in fact the durham police and crime commission is sort of asking the chief constable of durham to do an investigation into that case that is politics yeah directing the police uh, of course in london the mayor has a similar role anyway yes yes but we can expect the police to be on the side of the prosecution can't we i mean they want their cases to be to result in convictions that's their job isn't it yes i i mean yes yes obviously i mean that's their job they but there's no doubt in my mind police like arresting criminals and seeing that person face justice correctly yes but i also you know i i talk to police officers there is a genuine desire to reduce miscarriages of justice and wrongful convictions and wrongful arrests uh, I, I think there's um there's an impression there can be an impression upon some members of the public you know the, the police are all of a similar ilk uh, <laughs> and um I, I i disagree with that um yes everybody makes i make mistakes we all make mistakes if you make a mistake as a police officer and and you arrest somebody who's entirely innocent and then you start concocting up a, a case against them because you're susceptible to cognitive bias well you know for me those sort of people should be thrown out of the police effectively i mean it's because you you're going to affect someone's life and if you can get away with it once and it looks good on your record oh this guy arrests lots of criminals of course then that could lead to uh, greater risks for everybody and if it all collapses like a house of cards then um, it, it brings the police into disrepute we're getting into we're getting general, general. Um, yeah. 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 Is it, no that's not yeah. sorry that um, Facebook oh yeah I can see that one yeah so implicit by biases also can lead to wrongful conviction aren't they yeah prejudicial racial almost certainly i mean well yes i, I will argue um I, 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 being being a white male six foot five i yes. don't think there are many biases that are directed at me in that direction therefore i cannot imagine what it would be like to be say black uh, well, male, six foot five, black, but looking like you're, you know, a, an aggressive type or something like that. Those biases, absolutely 100%. Um, you missed skinhead as well off your description. Oh, oh well, okay, skinhead, yes. Yeah. Although there's, there's been times uh, uh, where in recent history or certainly in decades ago where, where, where skinhead was linked to uh fighting in the streets and things like that so so maybe i'm too old for that sort of thing nowadays anyway well <laughs> but yeah I do, I do agree and i think I, I will lead cognitive biases and prejudice and against people maybe cognitive biases are more likely when somebody is perhaps black and the observer is white uh, and um, certainly with the sort of eyewitness identification work that we've done we do know that um, people are far better at identifying people of their own ethnicity in general there's always exceptions than they are of other ethnicities and therefore yeah. if the um, the witness is a white person and the suspect is a black person and for whatever reason, the sort of police don't run a proper identification procedure. It may be also that the risk of an identification of an innocent suspect rises, even in those sort of occasions. Perhaps the, perhaps the police don't properly warn 
that the suspect may or may not be present in the lineup in the way that they would normally do. These, those sort of things can prejudice a case. And I absolutely agree with, uh, with, with the, 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 the writer there. Well, I'm not a small man, but you certainly towered over me, I remember. <laughs> yeah. So Ulysses wants to know if you've got any ideas as to what can be done. Do you think more can be done to tackle bias in the police system? Is it possible to undo to years of systematic inequality? Um, I think the systematic in inequality is not just within the police, it's within the whole of society. Can we do anything about it? Um, we need to change society. Maybe we can improve the diversity of the officers who are recruited to the policing and uh, you know all aspects um but then you have perhaps this sort of them and us situation where um i mean i again i i i cannot experience this so i cannot sort of state this is a true thing where maybe some members of ethnic minorities may think that police officers from their ethnicity are, are somehow you know siding with a, some sort of corrupt system or something like that uh, <clears throat> i mean yeah, you, yeah it, it, it is possible how can we improve the policing um better training um perhaps better education of police officers better selection methods should they represent society yes i do believe so should they be um however i you, you sort of don't want to be um negative towards people who are perhaps you know maybe it, it is a, a, a job option that many white young males feel is a good opportunity for them who may come from poorer backgrounds or something like that in the same way as many um, as, as some you know black people I, I think I, I'm just glad that I'm not tasked with improving the police service because because I, I, that's what com, it's what the commissioner of London's there for and chief constables it's it's their role um, I think it's easy to criticize and it's hard to change a system because you know people work for them for 30 years so you've got to remove you it, it's got to be a slow incremental change you're not going to change a whole justice system overnight yeah yeah. Even though we'd hope so. Not without a magic wand. No. <laughs> oh. So, another one from Will. I think he's, uh, he's using you as an opportunity to study here. <laughs> yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, so, could, you know, could we change the makeup of juries? Well, in America... They, 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 you know, do have this via doyer where you can sort of almost select the jury members or at least remove jury members that either the prosecution or the defence do not feel are suitable for that particular case. And you can imagine it may be due to political views, it may be down to gender, it may be social um, inequalities. We got rid of that. So theoretically, it should be completely random. I asked this question, I, I gave a lecture on, on, on rape myths, and I pointed out that some of the research, and this is just one area that I, I can speak to, um, what some of the research has shown that if you had a, a mock jury of mainly female jurors versus one that was perhaps equal numbers, actually you might get more guilty verdicts in those cases with exactly the same information about the case. So you could argue, oh, well, to make it fair in some way, it should be an equal split. So in my lectures, it's nearly all women. And I asked this question of the, the, the students. Um, none of them wanted to see anything but random. They felt random was the best way of, of doing this. Um, I think we went into some discussion as well about um, uh, what about sort of cases of uh, fraud, you know, sort of um, corporation fraud or corporation crime, which really quite complex cases. And obviously the sort of system works in a slightly different way on those. But generally the judgment, no, it should be random. We should all have access to a fair system 
And that fair system, if you're going to have juries, should be, well, you don't know who you're going to get until they turn up on the day. Yeah, so yeah, me. something that's worrying me at the moment is having lived most of my life under one jurisdiction, which has been official and authorised by our government, that, as you pointed out, is democratic. We elect it. And there are routes to campaigning to change and improve our justice system if we think it's not performing perfectly, which we don't. Now, since the advent of social media, we have another jurisdiction. We have people who can decide, for whatever reason, that they are qualified to judge and to convict and to imprison, well, to punish people against whom no charges have been made. I find that very alarming. Would you like to say something about that? Yeah. Um, I, I, think, I, I think there is a problem with the system. I think some of the reasons that people may be doing that is because they feel that too many uh, people who are guilty of crimes, of a certain type of crime, are somehow evading justice. For all sorts of reasons, I'll go to the you know the, the 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 rape statistics to start with suggests that you know hundreds of thousands of women claim uh, in the British Crime Survey that they have at some time in that year been raped. The number of convictions for rape are five thousand. I'm not going to even guess what the true number is because we hear about false allegations and. We, you know, where, but somewhere between 5,000 and I don't know what the hundreds are, yeah. there yeah. will be a, a genuine case of rape. And if you have too many of those cases, then that is a problem for the criminal justice system where too many people evade justice. On the other hand, the sort of judge executioner and everything from social media is out. And I, I must admit, I, I've been... Uh, doing a little bit of this on social media with a with a man who hopped it up to Durham only a few weeks ago, um, yeah. and I have been his judge and executioner on 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 social media. Is that the good thing? Well, how many people have the right to sit at number ten and, and give a, a, a statement in their defence? Um, Whereas quite easily that same person could have gone to the cabinet secretary and asked them to do an investigation into the alleged offence. Um, so, so some people have a privileged justice, and you could argue that with rich, a lot of rich people as well that they sort of got minders and systems around them. And we go to the sort of Weinstein cases, uh, and you can argue the Jimmy Savile case, which always. We come to back to in a way he was protected by the system criminal yeah. justice yeah. system and society uh, uh, and mem being a member of some sort of elite there um so i i don't i genuinely people have the right to free speech as well yeah well they yeah. don't today free speech is twitter or facebook they don't they do because Unlike when I was studying myself back in the early days of my studentship, nowadays students know platform people and deny them the right of free speech. Uh, it happens. I'm not sure if it's ever happened at Greenwich. It might have done. I genuinely don't know the answer to that question. It definitely happened. At Goldsmiths, where I did my PhD, not sure when I was there. Goldsmiths has got quite a sort of political history, though. Uh, and I think if I was far more politically involved, that's where I I would have gone for university, which I did anyway. But, um, yeah. So um, I don't know about no platform. I disagree with it instinctively. Mm. And... And the argument, the counter argument is, well, uh, why should this person be allowed to speak? There is a limit. And we all know about, well, you can't, you know, about the fire. 
can't sort of shout fire and things like this when there's no yes. fire. And, and there are, if there are people genuinely um, pronouncing hate or violence on individuals, then of course that's not free speech as we define it in no. any way. Um, yeah, I mean, a lot of the debate forces about sort of transsexual rights, which I must admit I am no expert on. on and, and I have a, quite an ambivalent view on it as well, so I'm not really sure what I believe. I think I would much rather both sides could speak civilly in a debating chamber without it getting to the sort of nastiness that it seems to have done, which um, which mainly is is not yeah not right. Whatever happens, it's the anonymity. Oh, we've got an echo. Yeah. So you can get away with things when you're anonymous, can't you? Yeah. Anyway, Josh, you have been brilliant, fascinating, oh. and we have all been listening to every word. But we've run over time because I normally keep oh. down to an hour, and and it's it's thanks to your the interest that you generated that we've we've spilled over. Anyway, brilliant. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much for having me. A Any time, not next week. Bit busy, but uh, <laughs> it's marking later the hat. It's marking season for you, isn't it? Oh God, yeah, yeah, yeah. The horrible bit, yeah. So I'm going to say goodbye and thank you. And if you want to join in with the comments that will appear underneath this video, feel free. Oh, okay. Right. Brilliant. Thanks, Josh. Thank Bye. You. Bye now. Now, I just want to announce to our viewers that to next week we have Sophie Scott, who is a neuroscientist who does a bit of comedy on the side. <laughs> She's going to be a fabulous guest. Don't forget to tune in for that next week. And we've got some other ones lined up as well. Look, Keep looking at our site. Bye-bye.